So the way to attack these, I know, I know isotopes are really difficult. The best way is sit and play with these and then actually do the, the calculations. So the way you, you attack such a spectrum is to say, okay, in this spectrum, are there any jumps of two? How many jumps of two do we have in this molecule? In this one. Okay, if we have a jump of two, we must have that smells of chlorine, bromine, or sulfur. So, is this bromine? No. Is it sulfur? No. Chlorine. A third here. So now we got this one chlorine in this molecule. That can be a great help. How many carbons? So, so hopefully, so the way to say is how intense is this one compared to this one? And let's assume that you say this is, you take 1.1%. This is what you read from here. Just divide that by 1.1% per carbon. See the carbon goes up and you get one carbon. So to the next one. So you go into the mass spectrum. First we, we decided, do we have any sulfur, chlorine, bromine that can tease us? Yes, we do have that. Because we have one mass difference of two. And it's not like they're going down like that, because then it would just be carbons. But we have something with, uh, we have, we have um, so we have one chlorine, and we only have one of them. So that we determine now. And after that, then we look at the ratio of the one with only carbon 12s in, and the one with one carbon 13 in. And then we go in and we say, this is probably 1.1% of this one. I can see that by eye, but it's <laughs> And we then divide that by... And this, this one you should always remember. So this is a constant. And then there's nothing left. Because wherever we take, if I <laughs> take a bite of you, we go somewhere else, we take a bite of the cake. If you go out and could isolate the carbon atoms there, Whenever you had 100 of them, you will have the 98.9, that will be uh, the carbon 12s, and the other one will be the carbon 13s. And the carbon 14s that are radioactive, they are so rare that we don't, we're going to look for a long time before we find them. So, how many jumps of two do we have in this one? How many? We have three major peaks, but we have one jump of two and one jump of two. So that means we, since we have two differences of two, we must have two chlorine, sulfur, and bromines. So we must have two of these atoms in this molecule, on this ion. That's the first step. If you look at the mass difference from here to there, it's two, and from there to here, this two. So, and if you take it the chance that you get these, it's 75 to the second power. And this one is two times, so this one can be because they will be identical if you have one chlorine 35, one 37, or the other. You know, we have two combinations that give the same mass. As long as you don't cleave that molecule, you're not, you cannot, uh, you, will you will determine those in one pile. And this is why this is two chlorines. 
because you take more or less 75% times 25 and you have two times and you add that up and then again here you have actually 25 to the second but because you have to divide that by 75 to the second it's, um, it's going to end at about 10%. I also think it's more important that you, you determine how many A plus 2 elements do I have and then you can also go into a computer and check and after, you know, after you've seen a few of these spectra you, you will recognize it. So now we determined we have two chlorines in. So uh, how many carbons? You can also see that, so here we have the ones with one, one chlorine 35 and one 37, and of course we will then also have some of these where one of them is a carbon, where one of the carbons is a carbon 13. So the ratio from here to, to, to here should be more or less the same as here to here. So how intense is this one compared to this one? Should we say two? About 2%. In this case, it's 2.2%. And you divide that by 1.1% per carbon, and that, of course, yields 2. We don't look at the rest. Then we have the last one. Does this iron, does these ions contain chlorine, bromine, or sulfur? No. Okay. They don't. We can see that if the isotopes are there, you will see them. So, how many carbons? Eight point eight. So, if that is 8.8% and divide that by 1.1% per carbon, you're going to get 8 carbons. Yeah, you can't, you know, you won't. Can you, can, you, can you measure this accurately? Of course, this is more or less plus minus two or one or two carbons. The instrument will, of course, be able to give you a better ratio than we can measure here. So I suggest you take them in this, this, and this order. Because now we're getting more nasty. So take it this one, and then this one, and then take this. This is a pretty difficult. How many A plus 2 atoms or elements do we have in this ion? Or this iron cluster, would you see here? Do we have any chlorines? No. We saw the other one. We saw this one. That if, if you have two chlorines, then it comes up here. And yes, if you do get three chlorines, it will go further up. But you're going to get many more jumps. So we had, don't have any. So we have one very simple atom that is very heavy. Bromine, yes. Perfect. So now we know we have one bromine in. How many carbons do we have in? What? Yeah. So you took what? This one and 12 or 11 percent. Divide that by 1.1, you're going to get about 10 plus minus one or so. You can't. You you need if you need to go. If you need to determine, you know, just plus minus one carbon by uh, on this ratio, so you need to go to a very special instrument type. So. So we have about 10 carbons and one bromine. Then there's this one. So how many jumps of two do we have? Yeah, we 
have one and one, yes. So we must have two A plus two elements. And we know how two chlorines looked. So what do, do we probably have if you need to guess a little bit? Sometimes it's easier to guess and then get it confirmed. Bromine. Yeah. So we have two bromines, yes. And the reason why this one suddenly gets the most intense is of course that you have here you, you must have two light and here you must have two heavy. But here you can have like you know it's a molecule and each position is independent on the other. So you can have it's a little bit like with two kits. So this is the space model I have. So if you have um, what is the chance that you get one of each sex? And you don't care which order they come in. That's 50%, right? You know, you can have a girl and a girl. You can have a boy and a boy. And then you can have a boy and a girl. Or a girl and a boy. And the two last one, you get in, in one with each sex. So that's 50%. This is exactly the same you have here. And here the boy-girl, girl-boy, have the same mass. I don't know how I can else put it. Yeah. Well, in this case, you could compare this one with this one, or this one with this one, and you should get the same percentage. Yes, because this one must contain two light bromines and only carbon 12s. And this one will contain the two light bromines plus one carbon 13. And this one will be, yeah, there will theoretically seem be some with two heavy carbon 13s in, but they're they, they will not constitute a very high percent. So as long as you are down with not too many atoms, as, as we probably will be in this course, it's, you, should, you should see that. I also think the important thing for you is, I want you to know that, estimate the number of carbons, you should do that in your head. You should also be able to see that there's probably, you know, if, if you go up to five or six chlorines, you, you can't see if there are five or six, forget it. You should spot it, and then you should know that, you know, now it suddenly gets difficult, I need to go to a computer. And well, then you should perhaps just know the combination. I can't even remember how the chlorine-bromine combination looks like, but any mass spec book will, will actually have it, and else there are even freewares that can calculate this for you. And so we can see that this one goes to about 10, 11%, and this one is, is about half, so we have about 10 carbons, perhaps eight, nine carbons. In. So do we have any bromine in this one? Yeah. You said there's nine carbons? 10, nine, yeah, I would say. This one? Yeah. Yeah? So you take the, the, this intensity of this relative to this one. Oh, okay. Yes. Or you take this one relative to this one. Mm -hmm. And then there's this one, and this one is difficult. So does this one contain bromine? No. Does this one contain chlorine? No. Okay. What the hell can then give this one that is coming up here? What? Yeah. And I recall it to be four or five sulfurs. And again, when you come up with those, because then you will, this one will, of course, there will also be 
this one will have the one with you can't use the a plus two rule to and count them when you have sulfurs because they are not very intense. I think I will, I will just upload the solutions to this one and you can look at it if you want to. And here we have actually an old exam question. So I hope you can still see that you take this one relative to this one and you can see that I got, I don't know, it ain't easy but 14, 15%. So we got 13, 14 carbons. But uh, anything else? Have you seen this before? Try to go a little bit back in your assignment. Yeah, two chlorines, yes. Again, you have two jumps of two. And there are two combinations of a heavy and a light. And that actually goes up to be about two thirds. And then the final one will be one tenth. And you had exactly the same assignment before, just with, now I just added some more carbons and some oxygens. And actually this is a real spectrum from the instrument. So, A major problem with mass spectrometry is that now we have the ions. We have looked a little bit at the mass of the ions. Now when we want to manipulate the ions, we want to move them, we want to, in certain ways, measure the mass to charge ratio. But what happens if we have a high pressure? Can we, in this room, can we move an ion through the air like this without it hitting anything? No. It's not going to move many nanometers before it's going to hit into an air molecule or some nitrogen or oxygen or whatever we have. So to be able to work, we need to have high vacuum. And uh, that means that we are probably down 10 to the minus 7, 10 to the minus 8 bar inside the mass spectrometer. And uh, a drop of acetonitrile has a pretty high volume at that pressure, probably the size of this room, if you can remember the ideal gas law. So a major challenge working with LCMS is that we have all our eluent and we want to get rid of that. And then we want to have the target analytes we have ionized and moved into the high vacuum. That is the difficult part. Because this is not a, you can say, a happy marriage instrumental wise. This has taken 40 years to develop. Now we are there where we can do it pretty well. Um, so do you think, can we analyze ethanol by LCMS? Is ethanol volatile? Do you think it will be easy to evaporate acetonitrile and not ethanol? No. So anything volatile 
we will remove in this evaporation zone. So um, the first way to, uh, to get this to work was a method called electrospray. This is a very low flow of liquid. And if you apply a high potential to the needle, and you, for instance, have zero volts here and plus some thousand volts here, you're actually going to get a spray. And you all have seen the results of such a spray if you go to a car. This is the way we paint. If you want a very nice paint, you actually have your spray, sprayer, and you actually have a, from the sprayer and to the, the car door or whatever it is, the robot that paints it, there's actually a potential difference. So it's actually a technique that has been used for many, many years in the paint industry. Because you get some small droplets that are going to shrink, and so it's a very, by applying this potential, you get a much finer mist. And of course, if you get a finer mist of droplets, and then you, we could, for instance, add some nitrogen gas, it's also easier to evaporate it. This is why we call this electrospray. This is how it looks. And if we could remove the potential, the spray will not be as nice. So the whole trick is that in electrospray is actually this potential difference between a space where we um, spray to. This is how some of the modern instruments look like. So here is a needle. And here is a small hole. And actually over here is the plate where you have the minus about three, five thousand volts too. And then we can create a fine mist here. This is a way to close this so we get no nitrogen in. But then, so this is at normal pressure. We have a tiny hole here, and here we have our spray. We have a big pump here, and then we can move the ions in here. Um, and we can't make a very big hole here, because if we do that, then of course too much air will come in, and we cannot, the pumps will not be able to follow. But of course, the bigger the pump capacity we have here, the higher hole, the larger hole we can make. So try to look a little bit into this, where you spray here, and then we can drag the ions in. And then to, to this, where we actually have the hole here, where we kind of spray directly into the hole. It means a little bit like if we could move this one up here and then spray directly in here. So. What happens if we have some stuff and we spray it and try to evaporate it with nitrogen? What do you think could happen here if we spray directly into it and not kind of over it? I have to discuss a little bit with the person next to you and what could happen to something that was a little bit big. Sugar we like. What happens if we spray this way over it and then try to drag the ions in compared to kind of spraying directly down to the hole? Can, can we give the explanation again? Because we didn't really understand how it was. So the fine mist is coming out here and kind of follow here. And then hopefully we will have some ions uh, in being liberated in the air. And so if it kind of hits here, um, if we spray directly into we try to spray more or less directly into the source compared to like perhaps spraying like this and then dragging them in what will happen to something really big sugary like you think Yeah. Where do you think it ends up? Ends up. 
So the, so the problem is that if we spray directly here, what will happen to, uh, let's say, something that is not ionized and big and uh, all the crap that's in your sample? It's going to end up here. It's going to build up here. And then after a while, it's going to clock the hole here, and then you will have no ion transmission. So the idea is that, and it also works, that and all manufacturers today, they spray kind of this way, and then they hope then they can kind of drag something in there, and then they get a much cleaner uh, tip here. And then also today, if you take this screw here and to this position, there will be no, then you can take this one off and clean it and put it back within 20 minutes. So it's very easy to clean the instrument. And you don't have to break the vacuum system or anything. Okay, there are other techniques. There is a technique called APCI, Atmospheric Pressure Chemical Ionization. This we use for electrospray is quite good for polar molecules, up to medium polar molecules, for, but for the very, very apolar molecules, APCI is often better. So here you heat it, so whatever comes out of the HPLC, you heat a lot. You apply a, a potential and, and put a lot of current here. So you have your vapor here, and the idea is that you try to make some uh, H3O plus ions, some positive ions, and they then will then meet your molecule here and end up in water and M plus H ions. And so for very apolar molecules, APCI is often better. And another thing is, and we'll come not much back to that, but electrospray is very dependent on what's, what is also eluding. So at all times, you only have a number of charges available. And uh, if something very strongly is, is coming out uh, along with your analyte, you may not see it. That's why, for instance, if we work with plasma or meat samples where well, there's a lot of crap in that will interfere, there we need to put in a sample. We have to put it into the meat or plasma, do our extraction procedure, inject it, and see if we can actually see it, even though we, we should with that amount, because we can have this ion suppression. The APCI have no problem with that, so it's, it's not dependent much on what is in the sample. There's a new technique called APPI. So we have our uh, HPLC inlet. We can also add some uh, toluene usually, and then a lot of very strong UV light. And you can actually use that also to ionize. That is also very good for the extremely apolar, the very lipid, lipophilic compounds. Uh, there's another technique here. Have you ever heard of Maltitoff? So this is uh, what you do on the very large proteins. You also use this for polymer analysis. So you, um, you have a matrix that is usually a small organic acid, something looking a little bit like hydroxybenzoic acid. So you have your protein or your solution there, kind of cast into to this uh, matrix, and you shoot with an, on a laser. You get ions, and that you can then drag into your, um, to your mass spectrometer. And this is a very widely used technique, mainly in, uh, in proteomics, but also in uh, working with uh, uh, polymers. And in many cases, it does not add so many charges as electrospray does. So all the proteomics labs, they both have electrospray or nanospray source, and then they also have a malty to, to characterize. And here you can see, so this is a pretty big molecule, IgG, immunoglobulin, and you can see here M plus H, and you do get, get some multi-charged ions, but if, if this was electrospray, you're going to see it with many, many, many more charges. So, actually on some instruments, this is why I try, I drag the boxes around the instrument 
So this is our iron source. This region is where we try to go down in pressure, so we have actually many pumps here, and this can then be a mass analyzer region. And so here you can have electrospray, but you can on some instrument, you can simply take this pit, bit off, take your electrospray source off, put an APCI source on, or put a multi source on. So on many of the newest, we can actually do this. So think it as a region where we ionize. We can then just have some focusing ions. If you don't, you know, try to contain them, they run away. So here we have some rods with electric, electric potential that will keep the ions in here. And small holes here, and then, of course, we can then, there's not as much gas coming in here. We can pump here and here and in these stages and go down in vacuum. And all instruments work like that. And some of the manufacturers, then you can also put a time of flight here, a TOF, or a iron, uh, iron trap, or a quadrupole, or whatever you have of, of mass analyzer in the final thing. But the rest could be exactly the same. So there are these techniques. There's an electrospray, which your samples will be analyzed with. And for the ones working with very low volume flows with proteins, they are usually calling it nanospray. And there are these techniques, APCI and uh, APPI. And again, as I just said, your instrument can be delivered with many ions. So again, in the electrospray, oh, it didn't. We want to have the droplets. We want to evaporate them. And of course, if you have a number of charges put here, um, and you shrink the droplets, you're going to get a higher tension of the charges on the surface. And the way that the droplets, you can then get a lower amount of droplets per surface area is by exploding. So you simply come to a point where there are too many charges here, and then the droplets will start to explode. And this is the electrospray. This is where we get this fine mist. And of course, we have some nitrogen. In this case, in this ion source, they also have some nitrogen coming out here. And then you can, if you have a potential difference there, you can drag the ions in there. And then you have a very tiny hole here. And that you can then drag into your instrument. So if you have a big hole like here, you have to have some kind of restrictor here so you don't get too much flow in, because then your vacuum pumps won't be able to handle this. And we have some really big vacuum pumps. I hope you saw that. So here was the, um, an example of an electrospray mass spectrum. And here you can see the difference, the different uh, charge stages. So, and of course, the more charges you have, the lower they go down. And you can probably not see the ones with the carbon 13s in. This will be probably with the carbon 12s, and, but the other ones will be more or less on top of it because most instruments cannot see the mass difference of one. Well, they can see a mass difference of one, but if you have 16 charges, the mass difference between the isotopomeres will only be one to a 16th. That's a quite low number. And there's some calculations you can do. So here's an example. So if you want to see if you have a singly or multi-charged ion, you simply go in, and then that you will have to do for your for the data you will have, we actually have acquired for you. So if you have a mass difference of a half here, you know you have a doubly charged ion. And if it was a third, you would know that it would be. Um, 0.33. That's because if you have a molecule, the mass of 1,000, then say we have um, M plus H, that's, of course, being 100. And then if you have M plus 2H, let's put a plus here. 
that of course is going to be the mass will be 1002. But we're going to observe this one at 1002 divided by 2. That's 501. But if this is a monoisotopic mass that was 1000, then it will, it will have one where one of the carbons is a carbon 13. Probably will have a many carbons. And that one will, as you recall, will have be one mass higher. So, so that one, the M uh, times one thirteen C will then, of course, have a mass of one hundred and one. So that one will be one hundred a thousand and three. Sorry, sorry a thousand. And then the one with one carbon 13 in will be 1,001. And then you take 1,000. If we add two protons, we're going to add up 1,003. Divide that by 2. And that's going to be 501.5. So you can simply see the start charge state of the ions by looking between the isotopes. Then, of course, things get tricky if you put chlorine in and stuff like that. And there are some software packages that can also help you here. And here we have a small protein we work with, so peptide, some will probably call it. And if you look at the isotope spacing here, so 839.0465 here. You will see that it's a sixth of an M over Z, it means that you have, or you can actually count. If this is 0.54, you find the 0.54, and that is one, two, three, four, five, six up. So you have six charges on. So this must be M plus six H's. And then you, of course, have to multiply that by 6, and then we draw these, and then you get the mass. So this is actually a molecule with a, with a mass of 5,025. Um, and this is, this is actually how the mass spectrometer looks that you work with, or that your samples have been analyzed with. So you have the spray here. We have a tiny hole here comes in with an iron funnel. So these are plates. And then the ions are moving away and we can then, by the vacuum pumps here, they can, because air molecules can also go this way, then we go into higher and higher vacuum. And then in this case, this is a time of flight, so the ions are moved here and we push them, go up here, and then by the flight time, we can determine their mass to charge ratio. We'll come back more to that later next time. It's just also how the ions go in, and this ion funnel is getting the most common way of getting ions in. You have a very high transmission efficiency. Okay. Just take this and we'll go home. During this spray, our molecules can take different ions. They could be ionized by different things. So if this molecule, bacterial signaling molecule, if that one, if this specific molecule gets a proton and it only has carbon 12s, it's going to end here. It takes a proton, one of these carbon and only one will be a carbon 13, it will be this one. And if two of these are carbon 13s and it still only takes a proton, it's going to end here. But some molecules prefer, or it also depending on what we have in our solvents, may not always take a proton. So some could take an ammonium. If we have that in the solvent, and we often have that, or sodium. And that, even though we have we use very high purity solvents, very high purity water, Everything highest purity, we still have these. We can also sometimes have a problem with that our, if we have a citronitrile, that will stay on our molecule. So of course, if a molecule instead of a proton 
gets a sodium, it's going to end here. And it's going to end up 22 higher. Because it's a sodium or a proton. And the sodium has a mass of 23, proton a mass of 1. Then the difference is a mass, is mass, of, mass difference of 22. So if you, in this case, we'll observe a jump of 22. And there's actually also some that instead took an ammonium, and those ends up here. And of course, some of them with ammonium will also have carbon 13s in, as the ones with the sodiums. So now we actually end up with a spectrum like this, where we will have a jump of 17. That is the difference between ammonium to a proton. We will have a mass difference of 5. That is the difference between an ammonium and a sodium. And the nice thing in mass spectrometry is that there's nothing that has a mass of 5. So if we have, even though we don't see this one, if we have a mass difference of 5, there must be something wrong because nothing has, so it must be a difference between two different things. And you will get some tables where, and you will very easily, you'll very fast learn to, learn to say, oh, a mass difference of 5, that is sodium to ammonium. Okay, then I also know what I have. Then you can see here, and this is very molecule dependent on what they do here. You can also see if you cannot interpret what we call this, this is an ad hoc pattern. If we cannot interpret this pattern, then we won't be able to determine the mass correctly of our molecule. So this is actually a very vital part of the course, being able to see this. And it usually isn't that difficult. So Secondary metabolites are different, so are the adduct patterns. So for instance here, something like ochratoxin looks like this. I have removed the isotopomeres that should of course be there. Uh, and the reason why you probably see this sodium is probably there's still a proton on this lone pair, but probably here is a sodium. Rhodin A here, a lot of oxygens, they usually love ammonium. In many cases there, the ammoniated iron will be the most abundant. If you have like a really basic molecule, you're mainly going to see M plus H because already in the solution, before it sprays, it will be charged. Cyclopeptides here, they are very much dependent on the size of the pocket in here of what they will do. But if you will have some where like some of the side chains are changed, Probably the spectrum will be totally identical, but of course, if it has an extra CH2, you're going to see that molecule eluding later and get, having a mass 14 higher. And this can be very dependent on, on the size in here. If you have something like linear peptides, yeah, yeah, I'm sending send you home very soon. We'll take this next time also. So linear peptides, you can get charges in both ends of the molecule. It is so that charges repel them very much. So you can't have, in a molecule, you will not have two positive charges next to each other. That's impossible. They're going to spread out as much as possible. That's why proteins can have so many charges, because it's the last molecule. So charges will have to be, uh, there will have to be a distance between them in space. And then, of course, some can be sodiums, and uh, you can probably also have some with two sodiums down here. And if you have basic amines on the peptide, you're probably going to see more M plus H, not as much sodium. Yeah. I will take these. We will start from here next time. So I think we'll stop here. <laughs>